you're like on some type of psychedelics, fuck like that shit would just like <laughs> mind blow you. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Did you make that background or where'd you get that? So it's a general picture. So it's just some picture I was looking oh, for. Oh wait, real quick, real quick. Do you mind yeah, yeah, if yeah. I start the recording already? Uh, did you wait? How long ago did you start it? Just twelve seconds ago. Oh okay, yeah, that's fine. That's because like I did it, yeah, and then yeah. on top Skype said, "Tell your tell your viewer that you're recording." Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. for legal that's purposes. why i like yep exactly that's why i like skype i just felt like we already kind of got the vibe going so we might as well start recording oh yeah i'm cool with that but uh yeah real quick that that background where'd you get it from so it's a picture so i was looking for a picture of perspective that i was just looking for random pictures associated with perspective and this was a like a like an artistic perspective um that was just like a general picture or whatever, very plain. And I just took it and just started messing around with it in the, in the photo editing app uh, that I use. And um, this is just one of the iterations that, this is, that, yeah, that's just one, sorry, that's just one of the iterations that, that came up. So you basically got an image and then you just kind of tweaked it, added your yes, own sir. little twist to it. Yeah, that's most of the shit, really. I mean, that's most that's most of my shit. Quite I mean, honestly, that's kind of that's kind of like what everybody does, I guess. We're all yeah. fucking inspired by each other. We're all bouncing energy off each other. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, but real quick, before we get too much further, I just want to officially welcome you, Sam Boy, to the Art of Human podcast for the second time. You are that's one right. of a group of like three people, I think, who have returned to the podcast for the second time. And honestly, it's it's kind of it's. Now that you're like the third third person to come back on, it it, mm-hmm. it, it gives me a sense of camaraderie to have mm-hmm. these people who have been on the Art of Human podcast not only once but twice. And, you know, me and you stay in touch. You know, yeah. we stay oh, up yeah. in the DMs. You send me some stuff and we'll stay in contact. So I feel like, um, you know, this is exactly this is the most beautiful thing about having a platform. And you probably know that, like having a platform gives you the ability to connect with people to build some type of community of people who who have maybe like-minded perspectives or different perspectives, but I think you have a group of people who want to grow and who want to share things and who love, you know? Mm-hmm. No, ex- exactly. That's that's what it is. You know, fortunately, you know, I'm very for- I'm very grateful that I had started doing this before the pandemic had set on and really it was less than about six months honestly i think because i think i started it back in august or september of 2019 and you know by you know march we would have like the first lockdowns and you know i was a really active person we had met you know what i'm saying at you know some venue at a show or something something going on you know in real life outside and this has been the way in which you know we keep in touch with people uh there's some people who i haven't seen for a full year you know what I'm saying, since this has been going on, but I've been able to main, uh, still maintain, as you said, that connection with them, maintaining that contact. And, uh, you know, that's and that's because at the end of the day, that's what's going to get you through, you know. Exactly. So what's been up with you, man? What's uh, what's been going on with your life? <sighs> so. I don't just close all this shit on my phone, getting rid of all, all these right, notifications. Good, I don't so I don't be distracted. But. <laughs> But for the most part, so like the first, you know, like the first leg of this whole shit, you know, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to just chill at home and not have to go to work. And then at a certain point, I did have to start uh, back at work and I was working at two jobs and basically back at both jobs, but at a limited capacity. So making so working less hours, but also making less money, Um, you know, between that and just trying to stay in contact with people. You know, I haven't been going out to, you know, I have gone out to hang out with people on occasions for the most part, either just one on one or me and like two other people. Um, I've been completely avoiding any type of, you know, group type stuff and, and you know, really not going out any more than I absolutely need to. Um, but, you know, but still just trying to, you know, keep myself engaged, keep myself from becoming too uh becoming too negative and too stuck because I'm somebody that very much likes to be in the know about stuff, follow politics, culture, and, and, and society in general. Right. But, you know, you know, it's, it's really easy to just get stuck in that. And while it's great to be aware of all these different things that are going on, it's like, okay, I life still continues to go on. I still have to, 
you know, saying find a way to be as productive as I was before under these new circumstances. And so part of what I've been doing like lately has been reaching out to other podcasters or just other creators in general and seeking to collab and, you know, just continuing that trend, moving out of my circle of just people I'm already familiar with and just reaching totally out to strangers. I actually just did. I had a conversation with a woman. Um, she does a podcast about sex and relationships. And I talked to her about incel culture and, um, you know, kind of the roots of it and, and the mentality of it as far as I understand it. And I want to continue to do that. And I've tried to set up, um, you know, interviews and exchanges with other people based, you know, saying in different domains. Okay, would you mind elaborating on that? Because I'm actually interested mm -hmm. in, I don't feel like I know too much about, you said, uh, in so, what was it that you Incel, said? I, said I, I think I just said incel culture or incel mentality, but, but incel, it just means involuntary celibate. And, you know, which just means somebody who, not because of lack of trying, but they are not able to, you know, say, find sexual or romantic uh, satisfaction. Okay. Um, and that can be, you know, and that could be from, <clears throat> and that could be from, you know, you don't have a, you don't make any good money. So you don't really uh, have the means to go out and, you know, entertain somebody else, let alone, you know, saying entertain yourself. Uh, Cause it does take a certain amount of disposable income, you know, saying to be, you know, actively in, in, in the dating scene to a certain degree. Um, you know, it could also be from your location, geography, if there's just, if you're just in a place where there's just not a lot of people who are actively, you know, saying on the scene, um, it could just be, you know, ideology and preferences and whatnot. There's just not a lot of people around there who have, who are compatible with you. Um, and so it can come from different things, but the thing that makes incel so unique, um, because it's not like people having a trouble getting laid has been, is a new phenomena, um, but they make it such a big part of their identity. Mm. Because they use it and they use because they use it as a moral play in that the reason that they can't get laid isn't from the other reasons that I mentioned, or maybe it's from bad grooming, or maybe it's from their own negative attitudes or their negative behaviors, right? But what they try to boil it down to is society itself um, purposefully trying to box them out. And when I say them, I'm primarily talking about younger men, uh, you know, usually men in their teenage years to their early 20s and whatnot. Um, even though the term incel, funny enough, was developed or created by a woman um, who was describing her, her, you know, saying difficulties in finding romantic and sexual satisfaction and whatnot, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the whole idea you, of incel is that you're inside of a cell? Like you, you've imprisoned? No, 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 no. Or, or oh, you know from? what? That's, I mean, that's kind of interesting you say that um, because it is, in a, to a certain degree, it does seem like a self-inflicted wound or like you're kind of boxing yourself in. But what it really just stands for is just, it's the word, it's the prefix of the word involuntary and then the prefix oh, of celibate. celibate. And celibate yeah. is pretty much just having sex, right? Oh, celibacy is absta uh, abstaining is, from sex. Okay, not having sex. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so this and, woman uh, created this term that has gained popularity to the point where it's, it's a part of the culture that someone could say incel and there's a group of people who would know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, it's huge. I mean, it's, it was started off as a, you know, it's a thing that, you know, primarily existed in the, in the, the terminology is used primarily in the online communities. Online is, you know, it's very meme -y, It's very, you know, uh, of this generation and whatnot. But it describes a lot of these angry young men who look out in the world and say, oh, women are just sluts and, you know, uh, um, I just don't have the right, you know, genes or I don't have the right, you know, same body type. They only go after these type of, do you know, things right there, you know, disregarding the fact that, you know, compatibility, you know, works in a multitude of different ways. There's people that you can go out with and find satisfaction with that other people cannot and vice versa. Um, but that's kind of interesting that you said like, oh, they lock themselves in a cell because kind of in a way that they do because they get they get stuck you know, mentally, psychologically, and believing all of these really just kind of conspiracies and 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 just basic, you know, ideas about about women and about sexuality and humanity in general, um, and to make and then they take that term incel, and even though a lot of people won't necessarily call themselves incels, it usually gets diverted into a different label, a different defense. Um, you know, basically what it comes down to is that they're like, okay, well, you know what? They try to do an inverse hierarchy shit 
where it's like, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, it's not, it's my difficulty in getting sex or getting, uh, finding uh, romantic partners isn't my fault. It's the fault of society. Society is in the wrong here. Society is living by, you know, uh, negative standards or destructive standards or shallow standards and doesn't live up to my potential. Therefore, I'm actually uh, the better person here because I'm not getting laid. That's, that's essentially the mentality. And, you know, I don't know if you remember the dude. Um, his name was, I think, Elliot Roger. He was a, uh, a young incel dude uh, who went and shot up a bunch of women, uh, uh, his women peers at his school. Um, at his high school. Um, I never heard about that. This is yeah, that was a big incident in the tw- I think the earlier 2010s or the latter 2000s. So um, there was a so there was a kid who went to his high school and killed women or killed. He girls? went there and killed and killed girls. And when they looked up, you know, his profile and messages and the way that his where his mind was, it was he was he was what we would describe as an incel. He was somebody who, um, you know, he's like, oh, I can't get laid, and had all these really negative stereotypes in his mind about how women are, and about sexuality, and about masculinity. And the fucked up thing is that you might is that if you're since you're not familiar with him, you might be thinking I'm talking about a dude who's not very conventionally attractive, uh, but he's very conventionally attractive. I mean, he could have, if he would have told you that he he worked as a model, you would totally believe him. Um, mm. But it was a matter of. You know, he locked him. He was in a cell mentally, psychologically. He had, he was trapped inside this cell and just filled with hatred and filled with misunderstanding and filled with this superficial uh, way of engaging with other people. And so, um, and and in the conversation I had with this uh, with that co-host, and I believe the podcast is um, um, shit. I can't even remember right now. I have to check it, but but it'll be coming out in a few weeks. But yeah, I talked to her with, uh, about that for maybe like 25, 30 minutes or so. Uh, she was also unfamiliar with the term and kind of the, the culture and whatnot, but it's um, it's important because it is playing off of, you know, a general human experience that has become used in a very toxic way, um, especially amongst young men. Um, you know, it plays off a lot of negative stereotypes of of the way that men look at one another, the way that, you know, men look at women, of how women are commodified and not seen as whole people. Um so yeah, so I, and 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 there's a pipeline of people who go from this sexual frustration to really extreme far uh, far right extremist um, uh, groups they align themselves with. Like I, I'm sure you're familiar with the Proud Boys. Uh, uh, yeah, I've been hearing more and more about them. I first heard about them on from Joe Rogan, mm-hmm. and then. Uh, I don't know. Maybe the computer's listening to me, but now YouTube is like sending up videos regarding them. Yeah, the <laughs> shit. Yeah, be, yeah. Because the thing is that like a lot of lefties like to say that oh that they're prioritizing right wing shit or that they're turning a blind eye to, to conservative stuff. And it's like, well, yes, to a certain degree, but it's because of the money. Um, the fact that this shit has gotten so popular just shows that there is a large swath of mainly men, young men, and especially white young men, who share these grievances. And they identify with whether it's the Proud Boys or whether it's um, uh, whether it's the Proud Boys or whether it's the fucking um, uh, the Boogaloo Boys, who you know that's much more of like an anti-government, anti-government, anti uh, to a certain degree demo- anti-democracy, um, white nationalist type shit. To uh, hell, even um, do you remember Gamergate? Were you familiar with Gamergate? No. Gamergate is probably... Uh, real, like, real quick, before we get too far into the next thing, do you mind um, kind of explaining more about the Proud Boys just to build more context for me and then people who might be listening? Like, who are the Proud Boys and what, what do they do? Like, what's their mission? So Proud Boys, I'm sure when you, when you learned about it on Joe Rogan, it was probably because of Gavin McGinnis. Yeah, right? I think so. That's like so one Gavin, of the main guys, right? He founded it. He founded it. Yeah. So Gavin McGinnis... <clears throat> Gavin McGinnis had started off. He was he's Canadian, and he started off as one of the co-founders of Vice, of Vice Magazine, Vice, uh, Vice News, when they were still just a small alternative media uh, news source. And before they started really getting big, he got booted out. Uh, I don't know all the per- I don't know all the reasons um, for that, but he parted ways with Vice after a while and started going in this much more far right extremist uh, path. And, you know, he goes on Joe Rogan to announce one day that he's founding, in his own words, a gang of white male chauvinists um, who are aggrieved at feminism, 
they're not too welcoming of, of homosexuals or just the LGBT, uh, ident- you know, people identity uh, uh, in general. And, you know, even though they have members that are not white, it is basically a white fascist movement. It is about prioritizing uh, what white, you know, white male patriarchy or white male dominance in the United States. That's explicitly what it is. And he's and he's said it multiple times in Joe Rogan interviews um, on his own platform um, and speaking with other figures in the alt right, like um, like uh, like fucking uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, Alex Jones, uh, several other figures in that space. And he's like, no, they are a criminal gang. They will shoot, stab, uh, fight, you know, saying whoever they believe stands in their way or represents the things that they don't like. Uh, They are a criminal organization. And even though he separated himself from them after they really started committing um, more acts of violence, their numbers have only grown and that and they've, you know, they've only uh, grown to affiliate themselves with other movements like the Boogaloo Boys and, you know, all these militia movements and these other far right movements and whatnot. Um, You know, he started the, the, the Boogaloo Boogaloo Boys. Is that similar to Proud Boys? Uh, no, no, they're two separate things, but I mean, they sh- but they overlap. They mm. they overlap. Um, the Boogaloo Boys. That's more of um, they're more of like an anti. Yeah, the Boogaloo Boys are more of like militiamen type, very anti-government, uh, very anti you know democracy. Um, they basically the mentality is they see themselves as the rightful rulers of society and that they should be dominating uh, policy and dominating the culture and dominating the discussion and whatnot. Um, and even though they share, you know, they have similar interests and whatnot, they have similar overlap, um, the focus and the inspiration, the motivations come from different places. And would you say these two groups is, like, from your own perspective, is it all cons or is there any type of pros from these groups of people? Like, whether it's from the actual group's actions or maybe what we're learning from them, like, mm-hmm. what would you say regarding that? I would say that, there's nothing to be learned. There's nothing positive to be learned from them. And, and the reason why I say this is this. So referring back to that discussion I had about with that, with that, um, uh, with the other woman for her podcast and talking about, she's like, she's, she, cause she asked me, she was like, okay, your familiarity with this. Do you feel that you yourself were an incel or, you know, going down that path? And I said, no, I said flatly because, um, I went down a different path because, you know, the, my interest, or I guess my initiation into this world and whatnot was through a different movement subculture called MGTOW, or Men Go Their Own Way, to acronym mm-hmm. MGTOW. And basically what it was, it's just, <clears throat> you know, young men of a certain age, you know, when you're trying to date or you're just trying to socialize um, and get to know yourself better, there's um, a lot of things that we don't learn, you know what I'm saying? We don't learn a lot of you know, how to be really truthful with ourselves. We don't have a certain insight. You know, we ma- male grooming, I should say, as far as having that emotional availability, isn't something um, that's prioritized. You know, that's often seen as something more feminine or something, you know, uh, more associated with women. Anyway, and are you point, talking about, are you talking about more like in the whole world or are you talking about more so like United States? Well, so, um, well I guess I, I guess I should just say the United States and, uh, you know, my, you know, Your my experiences. My I got you. Right now. In my purview of the landscape. Okay. Anyway, the point I'm trying to get to is that the MGTOW movement was interesting and I think really important and had a lot of pros because it was just making you be critical of the dating scene and being critical of consumerism and being critical of the standards that people have for one another and, you know, just really questioning, you know, saying what is it that you're bringing to the table, what things you can improve about yourself. It, to me, it was a lot more positive and a lot more insightful, but it would later become this incel thing because a lot of dudes would just get stuck and not make any progression. So, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, you take that critical mind of, I would say the MGTOW shit or where, you know, where I was at at the time and be like, okay, you know what? I can improve my grooming habits a bit. I can change the way that I can approach. I can try to, you know, fill my life up with other things. So that way I'm not just stuck on the idea of another romantic or sexual encounter, or even when that does occur, it will be more constructive uh, because I will not have this sense of like, oh my God, I have to make this thing work. I have to get to this certain point. Otherwise I'm not going to fulfill some particular standard I have. When I look at the incel shit, the reason why I say that there's no pros uh, pros to it because it's just delving further and further into that negative self-loathing and antisocial, um, you know, behavior. It's going in the complete wrong direction. 
um, you know, it's important, you know, it's like it's important, yes, to be critical of society and the standards that people set and to say, hey, I like this thing. I don't like that thing and understanding, you know, why why people do the things that they do versus saying, well, I'm superior in this situation or my moral code or my value system is should be reigning over everybody else's. And I'm going to enforce that through literally through violence and stirring up hate and mis- and misinformation on uh, on other people. Mm. To me, that's to me, that's the diff- and that's the big thing. And that's the critical thing where where, you know, it goes from being something that could be constructive and offer insights about yourself or about the world to where it's just a simple nope this is good and and this thing is evil and this thing that i see is evil or corrupted or perverted needs to be uh violently suppressed okay so you're, it, it seems like the first two things that you mentioned when it comes to the incel and the other thing that you mentioned that you were on the path not incel but uh MGTOW, MGTOW, yeah. which which could be seen as a, a precursor to the uh to it a, it's a you know, philosophy you could say Okay, well, those two philosophies seem to be more about, like, focusing on you, on yourself as an individual, you know? And like you said, it, it could have pros depending upon how you use it and depending on, you know, whether you're progressing or if you just get caught up in ideas and not executing things. Yes. But then you're saying that ideas like the Proud Boys and things of that sort, it's just exerting this notion that we're dominant and we're just going to... Just do whatever we need to do to prove it to you guys, and we're not going to really give a fuck. Yeah, and actually I would say, as a matter of fact, I would say that even though the, even though not, I would say that the incel, so if we're going to look at this as a progression chart, and MGTOW um, is like a, a neutral one or even a positive one, then I would say that incel is negative, and then like Proud Boys is like super extreme negative. Okay. So I would say, so I would say that I, I even look at incel as b- itself as being negative because it's only focusing on the cons and uh, very negative antisocial behavior um, that's self that's destructive for the individual as well as for those around them. Mm. That's really interesting that you mentioned these things because, like, for me, I've never been one to like be too much into these cultural like themes or these ideas and so like Mm -hmm. having conversations with you who is someone you know you mentioned earlier that you like to keep up with the politics and you like to be up to speed with the culture and all these different things it's insightful for someone like me who doesn't know that much about it because then now I can connect more with the community that I live with you know Mm -hmm. me and you could have another conversation about this and I already have the foundation for it and we Mm -hmm. can go to a deeper level of understanding you know yeah yeah exactly and that's the thing is is for a long time because because if you were to know me when I was a teenager, um, I was not nearly as engaged. I didn't have a desire to, and I just wasn't as tapped into stuff. And obviously, we didn't have uh, social media, um, you know, back then. Facebook was the first, you know, major one, and that wasn't released to the public till I think '07 or '08. And I graduated. I don't know when you graduated high school, but I graduated high school in '07. Okay. Or oh, uh, yeah, '07, and I think Facebook was open to the public. Um, in like 06, 07, and then like the rest of them will follow. But it took me a while to really... <laughs> somebody's banging on somebody else's door real hard in my apartment. Oh, um, but for a long time, um, I felt really out of the loop. I felt really nerdy and like I couldn't catch up and everything. Um, but the social media shit makes everything so easy for you to go through and, and you can Google anything you want. And it's important because everybody is becoming so much more fractured um, in society and, you know, a, a big part of being able to engage with a subset of people is the, the, the verbiage, the slang, the, the terminology, um, you know, the gab. It's like one of the first things you need to do if you're going to a foreign country and shit is that if you don't have somebody there to interpret for you, then you need to have some level of fluency in that particular language. Otherwise you're just going to be, you know, so many more steps back, um, you know, in, 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 in the way that you try to, you know, engage with others. What does gab mean? Say again? Gab? gab? What does that oh, mean? Gab, oh, gab is just a slang term for like, you know, verbiage or, or language. Okay. Yeah, ga- ga- or, yeah uh, gab is just like slang for, it's slang for slang. <laughs> <laughs> so do you feel like you were inspired to learn more about the culture because you wanted to be more connected with society in a way? I just wanted to know more what was going on because it's it's you could say that it's you could say that it's a um, a fear of missing out 
Mm. But I don't think that it's wrong. I don't think that fear of missing out FOMO is inherently a bad thing. Mm. I think that if you see, if you look over and you see somebody's doing some things and you're like, damn, I think I would really enjoy that or I'm at least curious about it. Uh, then yeah, you should go and and you know saying and you know go and try to see what's up with that thing and figure out whether you're really into it or not or if you feel neutral towards it. Um, you know, so I would say first it was just kind of tickling that curiosity of mine of just being like, oh, what's this and what's that. Um, but then as you get deeper and deeper into this stuff and you start to see how people's ideas and these messages um, and these philosophies become expressed in people's behaviors then you start to realize like, oh shit, this is actually super important and I need to now start getting the word out to other people who aren't as familiar with this shit. Um, you know, like I've, I've, you know, some of the podcast episodes I've done, I've explicitly talked about, you know, like these militia groups uh, like, you know, Proud Boys or, or, or um, Proud Boys or the fucking, the other ones I just, the Boogaloo Boys, right? Yeah. And some of my friends who I was talking to about a year, year and a half ago, it was just like, it was like a brand new world to them. But now you jump forward at this point and they are a part of the culture now. We recognize they've literally, you know, saying, tried to, you know, they literally beaten up people in the streets or killed some people in certain instances. They've tried to kidnap uh, heads of state. They they were part of the people who stormed the capitals along with like QAnon and a whole bunch of other, you know, saying right wing extreme uh, extremists. Uh, so it's it's a real thing. These little, you know, saying ideas and philosophies and shit that started off as just a little kernel, a little tiny subculture or whatever, have sprouted into something that has you know, literally made, you know, saying threats to, to elements of our democracy in our society at large. And you, you being somebody who's, who's intellectual, who's, who's been doing his research, you know, ever since I've met you, you've been someone who's, you know, you've told me and we've talked about it that you like to read upon what's going on. Mm -hmm. What do you feel as a society for maybe people who might be listening to the podcast? Like what can we as loving human beings do to contribute to something optimistic, you know, because like you said, you said that the Proud Boys are doing a lot of these negative things. What can we do as just everyday individuals to to help overcome some of that negativity or to, you know, just push us in a more positive direction? So I would say that there's two sides to it. <clears throat> I would say that there's two sides to it. It has there's a nurturing side and then there is a side that is more confrontational. So as far as the nurturing side, one of the things that I've read up about concerning uh, people who fall into religious uh, uh, institutions or cults or even cults is people are often, most all of us, almost all human beings except for true sociopaths are looking for a sense of family, a sense of community, a sense of togetherness and being a part of something bigger than themselves. Uh, almost all of us are going to be looking for this and people get into desperate situations or they come up not being conditioned to express themselves in a certain way or entertain certain ideas or even to put themselves in the company of, of other people who don't share the exact same uh, perspectives. And so they commit themselves to being in these very shut off communities. And so reading about the people who have come out of it or how people have been you know, retrieved or exited out of it or even hate groups, extremist you know, hate groups, is that having a connection, a consistent connection with a person who is challenging their ideas but still maintaining their humanity so somebody may be telling you that they've done really horrendous things or that they've entertained really horrendous thoughts um have really negative ideas and while it is important to challenge them and offer them an alternative uh that still solves the same issues that they're concerned about but isn't feeding into those negative elements which you which you see in their identities and whatnot right because you could say let's take a, a random issue like uh, immigration right immigration is a complicated issue um you know that that interfaces that in uh, that <laughs> that that you know goes into our our culture, into politics, into our economy, technology, et cetera, right? And so it is justified to have a critical conversation about that. And if you run into somebody who is saying, "Oh, you know, immigrants are taking our jobs," or that you know we need to be prioritizing people first, it's like. You know, it's like while it may be you to be like, no, you're an idiot, you're just a hateful person or whatnot, even though that may be true, it is better to 
engage with them and, and, and say, hey, I understand your concerns. It is important to be concerned about society and culture and really to understand who your neighbors might be tomorrow and next week and, and following forward. He said, but did you think maybe that we can confront the issue or deal with the issue with this solution in mind as opposed to this one? And it's not just going to be a one-off thing. It's, it's going to have to be something consistent. And you may find yourself no longer willing to to entertain or be as empathetic to them if they don't make certain progression, right? But 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 long story short, that's how I see that end, the, the empathetic side. Um, it's providing solutions. It's identifying the issues, that concerns that people have, and offering an alternative solution that doesn't feed into the negative behaviors which you uh, see in them or the negative values. Then, but then you have the other side. You have the confrontational side. You can say the warrior side. You got to have the poet side and the warrior side. Uh, the warrior side has to kick in because some people have made up their mind that, no, no, I know what I want. I want the supremacy. I want the domination. I want the, the, the suppression of people who I don't like, and I'm willing to use uh, any and all means up to murder in order to bring that about, to make that happen. And that's the moment when, you know, we, we have to recognize that diplomacy is not going to get us very far. Philosophy is not going to get us very far. We have to just confront them. Uh, we have to confront some fire with fire. Simple as that. Um, and that doesn't always mean like, oh, somebody has a gun, then you don't go and grab a gun or whatnot. But there's a, there's a, there's a thing that's gotten really popular over the years, uh, um, doxing, mm. where people, you know, they release personal information. Um, about somebody where they may live or who their associates are, blah, 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 right? Now, obviously, uh, there's a lot of ethical dilemmas with that shit. There have been bad calls and people have gotten docs that were wrongfully uh, said to have done things which they didn't do or associated with people that they did not associate with. Um, and it's very, you know, it's fucked up when that shit happens. Um, so is doxing almost like blackmailing? You're releasing information about someone to get something out of them? Or... Well, no, well, no, well, um, well, no, not quite, because blackmailing is more like you go to a person and say, hey, we have this sensitive information on you. And if you don't do this, that or the third, then we're going to release it. Doxing is the opposite. They're releasing it because they're hoping something might happen to you or that you will be motivated to change your behavior or the way that you express certain ideas and values and whatnot. Um, but they're both so they're so they're opposite. They work in opposite ways, but they're both about um, you have the same intent kind of thing. They kind of have the same intent of of forcing somebody's hands or, or forcing somebody's you know behavior and whatnot, and um, it's something that you know people on all sides of the aisle that people do for all sorts of causes and whatnot, right? And I think in an era when people have become so, when, when we recognize how much our institutions fail us, not because the laws or the rules or the, or the things are bad, but be, simply because the people who are in power and have the authority to make this call or that call are simply not fucking doing it. There's um, before I go before I go down on this other tangent, uh, but I think it's important. Um, I just want to say that yeah, that's the way I kind of look at it. And how do you deal with these situations when you deal with people, um, whether it's just espousing negative viewpoints, uh, uh, or even just making really nasty jokes that you think have a really nasty underpinning to them, or engaging in really negative behaviors? You have to be able to recognize the severity in those people of how much you want to tap into the poet or the philosopher or the diplomat and how much you need to tap into the warrior and the confrontational side. Um, but to me, I see that as like, to me, that's the, that's the main thing is bouncing back and forth in between like, okay, you know, where do I, you know, how do I move, you know, saying in this situation, because there could be further harm. We see that these ideas motivate people's behaviors and that these behaviors have harm uh, to everybody. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And it's I think undeniable. real quick, Real quick, just to kind of add something to what you're talking about, about this balance between the warrior and the poet, mm -hmm. I think something that I've learned and I feel like I've observed amongst just observing other humans is that that's why it's so important to take the time to build self-awareness because then you could learn, like, am I more of the poet or am I more of the warrior? Yes. You know what I'm saying? Because if you try to be one of them to an extreme level, but you're in fact naturally more of the other one, then you're going to struggle and there's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of resistance when you try to be that thing because it's not really the character that you are. Yes. So I think that's just an interesting point to make because it's just so awesome that you mentioned that because it kind of goes with what I've been learning by observing the world. Like there's people who are, everybody plays different roles. Everybody has different personalities. Some people are more extrovert, introvert. And if you learn about who you are, then you can capitalize and, oh, yes. and execute 
with much more power and power yes. in the sense and i mean that in an optimistic way you know like mm -hmm. just being able to to express your love and to create positive change no absolutely 100 percent. you know i i think you know it's like no you know nobody is of uh, we're not monochromatic you know, creatures, we're not, uh, uh, we don't just exist on one, you know, paradigm. We all, we each have multitudes and, you know, we, you know, at a certain point you have to recognize the fact, okay, I lean more into this domain naturally, but would it be to my benefit to also be pushing myself in this other domain? Because you never know when these other skills or these other insights, uh, might, might, might benefit you, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but going on that tangent of power, because that's what I wanted to get to. I'm so, so I'm glad you said that is, so in the realm of politics, I'm considered somebody who's uh, very left wing um, in my values. And left wing versus right. Left wing is is <clears throat> typically seen as and I'm talking about somebody who's who's, you know, either considered just left of center to, you know, being the most left, you know, leftist from like liberals to like anarchists and shit. Right. But left wing just in the sense of believing, hey, the benefits of technology, the benefits of the economy, the resources and everything should be distributed as fairly to people, especially to those who are laboring, um, as possible. And ultimately, we should be trying to create a society that is rewarding for uh, those at all levels, not just those uh, at the top or part of an elite's um, or that, you know, aren't a part of a, some elite, you know, elitist group. And... Um, and then also progressive socially and culturally in that, you know, pro women's rights, pro LGBT rights, uh, you know, pro choice, very, you know, embracing diversity, multiculturalism and all that good shit. Right. And power gets demonized and looked in a very singular fashion amongst people on the left where they talk about power as if it is inherently a negative thing. But at the same time, we're constantly struggling to get power and figure out the most effective means on uh, galvanizing uh, like-minded people and getting others on our side. Uh, people who identify as left-wing or progressive, we're you know, a minority in the country. And while we have some leverage within like, the democratic institutions to a certain degree, they can just as often just you know, wave, us, wave us off. So when talking about power, you know, I feel that a lot of people do themselves a disservice by not recognizing, you know, as you said, uh, uh, you could say optimistic power. They don't recognize when power can be good. So talking back about like the whole doxing and, and doxing and um, uh, the whole doxing thing, mm -hmm. um, I'll use a parallel of, you know, snitching in or use, using of informants or snitches in law enforcement. So people may not be aware, but many cases are built on. Uh, testimony either from people who rat out somebody else or rat, you know, rat out or, or, you know, whatever, or somebody testifying on the stand in, a, in the court of law formally. Um, and there may be, you know, secondary, you know, be other evidence that is submitted to, to add further context and really just kind of bolster it. But, you know, for the longest time when there was no evidence, you know, testimony was seen, is seen uh, in several occasions as being enough. Well, so testimony is pretty much just, just someone else saying they're a witness of what happened, pretty much. Yeah, tes yeah, testimony that I was a witness to this. I I see this, or I know that person, and you know, blah 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 blah. Uh, okay. Affidavits are also um, they're considered like a, a you know, affidavits are also just a form of like written testimony uh, that's submitted by somebody. Um, but it's all basically the same thing of somebody else saying that yes, I verify who I am, that I saw so-and-so do this or in this, you know, place where this thing was going on. Um, in any case, there's ways clearly in which all of these situations can go wrong or go right, where depending on who's in power and what the stakes are, that, say, for instance, somebody gets sexually assaulted, right? And the police get a, a um, they get the sex kit or whatever, right? And but then they leave it just in storage and they don't submit it as evidence in the court, which is something that has happened. There's, there's um, been rape kits that were discovered to have either been destroyed or just been sitting on ice for decades that could have proved, um, you know, saying that a sexual assault victim uh, was actually truthful about, about, you know, whatever happened to them. 
And part of the reason what we come to find out as well is that there are a lot of law enforcement officers who would be implicated if they actually test or government officials or people with power, right, formal power in the institutions that would suffer as a result of this information being disclosed or submitted to a court of law. So it gets ignored. So then what happens is you have, you know, journalists or people that are really good with computers and, 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 and networks and shit like that who they end up releasing the information on themselves. Um, or excuse me, not on themselves, but they end up releasing the information themselves. Docking, um, right? Pretty much? Docking? Uh, docks, uh, doxing. Oh, doxing. Doxing. Uh, so they end up releasing the information on themselves, and while it may be illegal, technically, in the court of law, it is actually serving a much more um, end of optimistic power. or seeking justice um, for these victims and bringing those whom we entrusted to be in charge of these institutions and follow the, you know, the, the, the you know, the laws and the books and everything and make them accountable, keep them accountable, keep them honest. Um, and so, and the reason why I bring up like left wingers and progressives and whatnot is because there was another incident where, oh wait, do you remember Al Franken? Uh, name sounds kind of familiar, but I don't know. So he was, uh, he was a uh, comedian. Uh, he was big on SNL, and then he ended up becoming a political official. And he had been in for decades. I forget what state he was from. I don't remember. It's Michigan or Wisconsin. Anyway, he was accused of a bunch of sexual assault allegations um, and whatnot, right? And this was just around the time of an important midterm election um, that was going on in Alabama, right? And it was way. It was going to be way too close than than it should have been, right? And one of the in the Republican. Um, in the bat, in the in the race was 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 uh, uh, a child predator, a, se- a child predator and a sexual predator, right? But he was still doing really good in the polls. Well, what happened is Al Franken, you know, had these uh, accusations, these allegations um, from I think about eight women of you know various you know uh, uh, behaviors that he had engaged in, inappropriate uh, behaviors he had engaged in, and there was a huge back and forth within. The party about do we expel him because we don't want to be seen as hypocrites and it'll also probably help us secure the vote and make people want to make sure they come out and support because they'll see that we're consistent or do we keep him on because we're not going to just boot out one of our own because that's what the Republicans do. Um, and basically a lot of left wingers and progressives were on the side of the ladder where they're like, no, fuck the Republicans. We're our morals and what we want for society is better. So we shouldn't kick Al Franken out because he's also a champion for a lot of these positive things. But the decision that ended up coming down from the establishment, funny enough, was like, no, this will be better for us politically. And he's just going to have to be the sacrificial lamb for that. Hmm. And, you know, to, and that also just kind of crystallizes, you know, how a lot of people don't understand that wielding power whether for positive or negative ends will in in either scenario will often make you have to make moral or ethical trade-offs that you prefer not to make hmm yeah that's kind of i love that you're saying this because i actually i read a book have you read the book green light by matthew mcconaughey no i've never even heard of it oh it's a pretty dope book called this is what it looks like. Uh, you can't oh, shit. see because my background. You can't see it because the background. Fuck. Actually, put it in front oh. of your. Uh, uh, okay. You can kind of see hold, it. Hold it a little. More. I was gonna say like hold it like in front of your like your chest. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. There you so go. it has a green light on it. But anyways, I, I he kind of Matthew kind of said it in some shape or form, but then I kind of just spontaneously came up with this thought and I wrote it down like yesterday, but it was something like. When you lose, and I'm obviously kind of changing it, but it's something to this extent. When you lose mental clarity, outlaw logic. Like, basically, the whole premise is that, like, when you don't feel mental clarity or peace of mind, like, mm-hmm. outlaw logic, like the logical thinking of what's right or wrong, and just execute on what you need to do to get that mental clarity. So, I think that kind of goes in yeah. hand with what you're talking about, because, you know, you're going to be in situations where you have to battle between what's ethically right or wrong but you know that if you make this decision the consequences is likely to be something positive and your intent is to get something positive and so that's something that 
there's actually like a chapter in the book that Matthew McCon this book by Matthew McConaughey and it says like outlaw logic and it's so funny because like learning about his his uh upbringing and the culture that he lived in like it was mm -hmm. a very different lifestyle from my own and some of it what? might might seem unethical but it's like he's a fucking awesome guy yeah hold on just so what what was a uh... Um, but that's all I wanted to say about power, and I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, I wanted to ask, what is Matthew McConaughey's uh, background and upbringing, and then what, and then any thoughts, and then any further thoughts about the dynamic that I that I made about power and moral trade offs. Uh, well, pretty much everything I know is based on this book and some of the interviews that I've heard. But pretty much, he grew up in Texas, and uh, you know, he was in high school, and he was like that good-looking guy and just charismatic and social. And I don't know, one thing that's coming to my mind is like when he first started off in high school, when he first got a car, it was like a truck. And this truck had like a microphone. So when he would show up to school, he'd be that kind of goofy guy on the microphone, just like saying shit and the girls would be laughing and stuff. And then like he would be getting with like the most attractive women. And then all of a sudden, like one day, he um, he decided to buy like a Nissan, like a, like a Z, like a 350Z or something like that. Because he mm. thought that this car would give him more... He would appear more attractive to to women and so he buys this car but then all of a sudden he he loses his flame he loses that heat because he didn't need to try he was just kind of kicking back on the car yeah expect the car to do the charm but mm -hmm. the reason the women liked him was because he was that goofball it was because he had that truck who they would go off-roading with so that's kind of one saga. I don't even know. I don't think that really has to do with the, what the fuck we're talking about. But no, I, don't I just know wanted why. to know. I just wanted to know about. Yeah, I just I just asked about his background because I just wanted. Yeah. to you know. Oh, that's right. Uh, so he's kind of like that character in Texas, and then one of the one of the so he kind of builds context for you in the book, kind of starting off telling about his mm -hmm. background, his parent dynamic. Um, but his parent dynamic that's probably one of the interesting things that he talks about. He talks about how um him and he has i believe two other brothers so a total of three brothers and that's it no sisters like each one of his brothers had to go through a moment where they became eye to eye with their father mm -hmm. so for instance like um matthew there was a time and opportunity that he could have gone eye to eye with his dad he yeah. came back home he ate at like a pizza joint and him and his friend bailed and didn't pay for the tab so then they show up at home and his dad was on the phone. He had just gotten off the phone with Matthew's friend's parent who had just called him to yeah. tell him about what happened. And then so when Matthew walks in, he's like, yo, like, did you not pay for that pizza? And basically, Matthew was just coming up with some bullshit. And then mm -hmm. his dad's like, I'm going to ask you one more time. Like, did you not pay for that pizza? And then he fucking pussied out and like lied again. So his dad basically like fucking like punched them to the ground. <laughs> and then then his dad was like, now you punch me like, you know, you have so much balls like fucking punch me. And mm. then Matthew just ends up crying and going to the corner of the room like that was his opportunity to go eye to eye with his dad. But he yeah. didn't do it. And then basically, long story short, like later in his early 20s, like he ends up doing that. Like he ends up he goes to a bar with his dad. And then the the security guy like starts questioning his dad whether he's like uh, whether he's enough to be in there. No, no. He asked his dad if he had paid for the tab, and then his oh, dad okay. was like, "Yeah, I paid for it." And then his dad just kept walking because he he knew he paid for it. Right. And the security guy was like doubting his dad or like maybe put his hand in front. And mm -hmm. that's when Matthew just flipped and he beat the shit out of this security guy. <laughs> and then basically after that is when he got eye to eye with his dad. And then now all of a sudden, instead of being at the table listening to his dad shoot the shit and just yeah. listen, he was a part of the conversation. And he was a part of that. Like, now he's eye to eye with his dad. And so just little stuff like that. Like, his mom also at one point when he was a kid, like, threw him into this, like, river that had a waterfall. or a, uh, She pushed him into the water, and there's a waterfall. Shit. And <laughs> God like, damn. <laughs> basically had to, he basically had to swim to the other side to survive. And so a lot of it... It just kind of showed me that, like, you can live a completely different lifestyle and, like, but you could still come out learning a lot of important principles. And, like... <laughs> That's pretty so, fucking wild. I was not expecting that to go, man. Yeah, dude, it was like... Like, like, th like listening to that, I'm kind of surprised at how uh, seemingly stable and level-headed uh, uh, Matthew is at this point in his life. 
Well, dude, like he's been through a lot of tribulations. Like, you know, when he got famous, he he was pretty like, you know, it's just a mind fuck. Like he literally says in here, like uh, there was a particular movie that premiered. And so like one day, let's say today, he went to the beach and he went to like his favorite sandwich shop. Mm-hmm. He gets his sandwich. Maybe two people out of the 400 knew him. Yeah. Then that movie came out. I forget the name. He goes to the same exact thing, does the same exact thing. Now everybody, everybody. but two people didn't know him. Yeah. And so he had this whole like 180 flipped on his life. And uh, I guess bottom line, this is a very interesting book. And it's very insightful because it's personalized and he has his own notes on here. And he basically writ- wrote this book. He took like a 50 some day journey out in the desert completely by himself. And he took all his journals. He had like collected over 30 journals throughout his lifetime. Mm-hmm. And he ended up writing this book, which is a concoction of of notes and just wisdom that he's a, he's collected and just talking about his life. And so you get a lot of personal anecdotes, which is super awesome because you get to see that perspective. Yeah. You know? And you get to see kind of how we could all come from different backgrounds, but we could all get to the same place. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's, you know, it's people giving this people being given the opportunity, you know, to redeem themselves It's people given opportunity to show that they can, commit to better behavior that they can change their perspectives all that shit like i'm very much a believer in the idea that people should be given second third fourth fifth six opportunities as long as they're showing progression at each opportunity to actually change shit you know if you're making the same exact mistake in the same way and you're not showing any progression trying to change your shit then it's like it's kind of hard to justify you know forgiving you um and whatnot or giving you any other allowances but it's like if somebody continues to fuck up but they fuck up in a different way or it's showing that they're at least trying to do things in a different way then it's like no people you know i'm I'm very much a believer not so much in that oh people are inherently good or that people are always trying to do the right thing because that's vague and 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 it varies what's right or wrong right um and the unintended consequences of any you know set of of behaviors but <clears throat> but that most people i believe i just believe that most people are trying to live peacefully and, you know, getting along with, you know, those around them and not trying to get in anybody's particular way if they don't have to. Um, problem is, you know, you can set up a system or set up a society or a culture and expectations where certain behaviors, negative behaviors are incentivized uh, versus positive ones. Um you know, and as a, we know, it's interesting. Actually, as a matter of fact, uh, to talk about something else in this vein, actually, did you have anything else to say about like power uh, and moral trade offs? Uh, nah, nah, we could that? just keep going with what you're okay. saying. Okay, okay, cool. Have you been keeping up with the GameStop? Oh, excuse me, the Game uh, the GameStop um, market issue? No, GameStop. Talking about that? legit the store, right? GameStop. Yeah. So GameStop. Uh, so GameStop has been having a lot of financial troubles and whatnot, you know, uh, several years, closing a lot of retail locations, firing employees and shit like that, right? And their stock price is plummeting. Well, there is something that – a practice that's known as um, uh, fucking short selling. And it's when people in finance, uh, in the markets and whatnot, they will uh, bet essentially they're gambling that a company will continue to lose value. Right. Based on their stock shares, it's basically betting that a company will fail, you mm-hmm. know, what I'm saying or will do worse business. And, uh, you know, it's super fucked up. It's super unethical, but it's fully legal. And, you know, people make billions and billions of dollars betting on the demise of of of, you know, of companies going out of business or people losing their homes. This is part of the this is part of the reason, a big reason for the 2008 financial crisis. When so many people lost their fucking homes because all these wealthy financiers and these banks and shit are doing all these bets and gambling amongst themselves and fucked it up. And then the price got paid not by them, but by uh, regular people. You know, retail investors is the term that they use. Anyway, what's happened with GameStop was basically the same thing that you had a bunch of hedge, fi- uh, hedge fund, um, hedge funds, which are this, these, you know, large, uh, 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 cooperations of money and resources and shit by these, you know, groups or individuals betting that GameStop making billions of dollars uh betting that GameStop is going to be going out of business and losing more value. Well, what happened is a bunch of redditors from the subreddit Wall Street Bets or something like that uh basically got together and said we're going to make these hedge fund uh 
motherfuckers lose billions of dollars, which they did. And they did it by going and inflating uh, GameStop stock value by buying it up. So mm. essentially what they did is that they fucked up the, the, the temporarily they fucked up the short selling attempt by the hedge fund managers and shit who were betting that GameStop's value was going to uh, continue to go down, which is how they earned their money. But it started going up. And so they lost, I forget the exact number, but they lost, there's billions of dollars that got lost out of it. And so, and then of course the SEC, oh, it's not the SEC, but the, but the people in charge of, of, of this stuff, not any federal or government agencies and whatnot, went and shut it down because they basically because they're like, no, the working man, the regular people shouldn't be able to do what we do every fucking day. Hmm. And so that's a saga that's played out over the last several days. And it's, it's, it's really just, it's super illuminating because it just really goes to show, reinforce the idea that value is arbitrary. Money is not real. It's not tied to anything that's fixed. And a lot of the people who are super wealthy in this country did not get it through hard work or through any type of means that we would deem as ethical. It was literally gambling with the lives and pensions and, and you know, the little bit of scraps that people have um, who are working class. If they have, you know, benefits like a pension or a 401k or health insurance and shit, hmm. you know, or, 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 they're, or they're the first or they're the first generation in their family. Uh, to to own a home or own property, own land. You know, these people, they gamble with other people's lives and shit every fucking day, and then they go out here and they lose a fraction, a small, a, a small fraction, a sliver of their total wealth, you know, and they went and shut it down immediately. And do you think uh, these uh, wealthy people who are betting on these the demise of these businesses, does them betting actually influence the business to go downhill at a quicker rate, or does that... Does their betting influence the fact of the business going down itself? So I don't know the shit, you know, I don't know the shit that deeply. I've only become familiar with some of these terms or what they really mean um, in these last several days. So I won't, you know, I, I don't want to make any, you know, bigger statements or speak outside of my, my understanding. Um, well, I don't know if, the, I don't know if the gambling in and of itself hastens it. I just know that, you know, oftentimes they leverage the losses, any losses mm. and shit. They leverage that shit against the people who are already struggling and already don't have, um, you know, much to, or they have, they have a lot to lose. Or excuse me, they don't have much to lose. You know. I get you. So basically, like these people, instead of betting on the demise of a business, they can be looking for ways to help businesses mm -hmm. or to to somehow give back to the community instead of trying to to get something out of it. In a way. Yeah, they yeah they could be doing that. They could be doing that, but they earn a lot of their money through you know really shysty fucked up means and passing the bill down to you know middle class and lower class working people. And so this was an example of the GameStop shit of, of the for the temporary uh, moment that it lasted um, of them of them being able to make these companies and these groups and these hedge fund you know pieces of shit um, make them lose uh, some of the some of the money that they've gained through. Um, this really destructive means, but it, but it does go to show again that like, yes, this shit is arbitrary. The stuff that has value is what we, is what we say it does. Nothing, none of, almost none of this shit has an inherent value. Nobody really knows what the price of anything is worth because none of these prices really mean anything, you know? And that's not to say that we shouldn't care about the economy. We shouldn't care about what's going in and what's coming out. But in terms of a lot of the shit that is seen as complicated or beyond our understanding really is pretty straightforward. It's not as complicated as they as they try to make it seem. Hmm. So what is it that you're saying is not that complicated? What what I'm saying is is so because all of these redditors decided to just go and buy up stocks of GameStop and everything to buoy the price of it, to buoy its value, right? This showed that that you know, I, I said hedge fund pieces of shit, but, you know, these tools of capitalism and capitalism, I know, gets a really bad rap these days and it's seen as being inherently evil, but that it is within all human beings to the potential to gamble, the potential to uh, see an opportunity, you know, to make positive or negative change um, in somebody else's life, to pool one's resources and information together to the, to those to, uh, to meet those ends and this was an example of when something that was typically done in a very negative fashion for most regular people was put to very positive use mm. 
And and to me, and, and to me, that was, you know, what I say is obvious. Um, you know, is that is that this isn't such a huge um, this isn't something that you need a degree to understand. This isn't something you need to be in a special click uh, to understand. Anybody can download the right apps or, you know, what I'm saying if you have enough money to to, you know, contact the right people and put in these orders. It's a op- it, you know, a lot of this stuff is um, is publicly shared. Anybody who has enough money can go and buy shares of these companies, yada, yada, yada. And at a moment's notice, you can deflate or inflate the value of anything. Mm, dude, that's pretty interesting. It, I think that's a good thing for you to mention as we're starting to wrap up. Because mm-hmm. I think, um, you know, it kind of goes to show that anybody could have the potential to have an effect, you know, among society. Mm-hmm. But also just to demonstrate that, like, like you can empower yourself by making decisions that are going to be optimistic. Because mm-hmm. I think I think that executing on things that are positive it inadvertently feeds yourself positivity Mm -hmm. making a decision that is with the intent of love and helping other people it inadvertently feeds yourself with that kind of love right back at yourself Mm -hmm. and then it gives you more confidence to then continue to be on that trend Mm -hmm. you know and be and be strong enough to tackle things that requires more courage and more courage and more knowledge and more awareness and more experience Yes. You know? Yeah, and it's it's very challenging because a lot of people feel that doing the right thing or doing something that's positive for others should be inherently easy or that they should always be feeling good and and you know what I'm saying it's like no, it's very difficult to do the right thing because quite frankly there are plenty of people who who recognize what you're doing and for whatever their motivations are, whatever the inspiration is, are anti you. They are anti they are against you. You are for, you know, diversity or you are for multiculturalism um, and different peoples from all over the world collaborating and whatnot. And there are people that are like, no, th- this land should only be for certain people. These resources should only be for certain people. And they are willing to kill over that. You know what I'm saying? For that or make a multitude of laws in order to stop that. And so it's like doing the right thing or doing something good and positive for yourself or for others uh, will be difficult. It will be stra- uh, stressful. It can make you anxiety ridden. Um, it can make you, um, you know, it can be tedious. It, it may require you to do a bunch of research and to try to understand the details of something that is really outside of your comfort level or outside your primary interests. Um, but it is necessary. You know, a very simple, straightforward example is, you know, uh, fitness, health, you know, health and fitness. Nobody at a certain, it's like in the beginning, if you want to get back into fitness and exercising and whatnot, of course you dread it. Because you're trying to get your body conditioned to exerting itself this much, and you hate it, and you're out of breath, and you're sore, and you're blah, 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 and it doesn't feel good, right? But then you get more acclimated to operating at that level, and then it just becomes a normal thing. It just becomes a normal part of your routine. And then at a certain point, you may say, you know what? Let me see how I can take it even further and get acclimated to another level of that shit. And it works the same in every other domain of life. You went, you get to certain levels in your relationships. You get to certain levels of your emotional intelligence, of you know what I'm saying, your education, you know, your education and, you know, in everything. And, you know, it requires us to push ourselves and to recognize that to sometimes get to something really positive and constructive and good, you have to go through a lot of uncomfortable uh, and a lot of, you know, negative, you know, feelings or thoughts or experiences um, on the way there. Yeah. And something that I'd want to point out just from my own perspective and you know take it with the grain of socks it's just my perspective but Mm -hmm. i do believe in discipline i do believe in the idea of having to go through tribulations and life is not you know life does not revolve around the way you want to see it Mm -hmm. but i also do believe that if you and i know this term might have a a weak connotation because in reality it kind of it does make you in a way you do expose yourself to be weak but i think if you can make yourself vulnerable i think if you could surrender yourself to to accepting the reality that you live in and not accepting in the sense that oh i'm just gonna i'm gonna accept the fact that this person's making fun of me i'm not, I'm not gonna do shit about it. i'm not saying it in that sense i mean accepting what you feel in the moment mm-hmm. and coming to grips with it and trying to understand with it and being patient and being grateful for the present moment you know counting your blessings with regard to like what are some things that i'm grateful for you know, being able to breathe, being able to have a fucking bed to sleep in, having food. I think um, if you take it to the most rudimentary things like that, 
I think that life is not that hard. And I know that might come off as, I don't know how people might perceive it, but I really think that if you surrender yourself and you accept things for what they are and you just do things with the intent of loving yourself and the world around you and trying to be matching what you want to be what you need and what you need to be what you want. Mm -hmm. I think if you can find that middle ground, I think life becomes easy and easy in the sense that it becomes effortless because everything you do is fueled by love and with love and happiness. I think we all know that it doesn't cost you energy when you're hanging out with your friends and you're just fucking joking and having fun. Like it doesn't cost you when I used to go for fucking 12, 16 mile runs. It didn't cost me anything because I fucking loved it. And I know you could relate too with all the research and shit that you do. Like I could tell you love that shit. So yeah. when you go out there and fucking look up on your phone, all this research and you spend hours or you might read a book or you might watch a video. That shit doesn't cost you anything because you fucking love that shit. Right. You know what I'm saying? And like, of yeah. course, I'm not saying that. There's never points in your life where you don't feel discomfort. In fact, I'm saying it's not about avoiding discomfort and that you won't feel discomfort. It's about embracing the discomfort. Yes, embracing it. That's the part that I feel isn't talked about enough in society. It's all about the grind and it's it's all about, yes, avoiding the emotions and and it's about just, just writing it out. But it's like, no, like, yes, there is tribulations, but it's about embracing them, not... Mm -hmm. just fucking surrendering and slaving yourself away at the fact that this is just terrible and my life's gonna suck and i shouldn't feel good like fuck no you should feel good when you're like Mm -hmm. when you're when you're embracing pain for love it feels good you Mm -hmm. know what i'm saying yeah no you know what i'm saying like if i if i like when i go and you know the other day like i went on a 17 hour fast or something like that I feel good to be disciplining myself because I wasn't that grateful for the food that I was eating. So when I feel my stomach kind of turning because I'm hungry, it feels fucking good. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I think it's, it's fighting, finding that, that harmonious place of, of doing what you need or what you want is what you need. And what you need is what you want. If you could find that spot, I think that's a beautiful place. Yeah, then yeah, that's the dichotomy. You know, that's the you know, that's the yeah, that's that's it. You know, it's it's that balance of, as you just said, the things I want to do and the things that I that I gotta do, and you know, you may feel yourself, <clears throat> you know, more leaning more into one or the other, you know, depending on the day. But that just you know that should just be a, a sign of feedback on the way that you need to try to push yourself so that way you can maintain, you know, what I'm saying homeostasis, maintain balance, you know, because then, because it's very easy to have you know, a bad day, you know what I'm saying, or have something that's really bothering you, you know what I'm saying, on one occasion, and then for it to come up, you know, say maybe maybe it skips your mind for a couple of days and then it comes back like a week later, a month later. And it's like, damn, I keep having this recurring fucking thing that's bothering me. It's like, obviously I should confront this because it's getting in the way, it's taking up energy and space that I want to be contributing to, you know, something else. You know, it's, sh- it's clouding my vision and not allowing me to see, you know, the potential for, you know, other shit going on you know, or something that could be, you know? So, yes, yeah, so, but so, yeah, I definitely feel you on the, um, I, I, I almost thought you were going to go into, cause I'm glad that you said that you specifically mentioned embracing discomfort because, yeah, yeah. cause, cause, you know, there's a, um, there's definitely like a culture of, of toxic positivity that's trying to counter the cynicism. It's like, it's easy to be cynical and shit, but then there's also these people who are just like, no, just, you know, just smile. The more you smile will actually make you happy. will make your life better. It's like, no, if you're behind on your rent or if you don't have enough food in your fridge and shit, like no amount of smiling is going to, you know, say make you secure in those, in those, in those fashions. Um, you know, but if you do happen to have those things or those things are within reach, or if you have to push yourself in a certain way in order to um, attain other, you know, resources, uh, uh, ah, excuse me, other resources in your life or relationships or to put yourself in proximity to certain things or places, um, you know, that's what it takes. You may have to lean more into pushing yourself on the things that you want, or you may have to push yourself more in the degree of doing things that you um, just absolutely have to do or that are productive, conducive to getting you to where you want. And you just got to, you know, you got you to be able to juggle. You got to be able to juggle that shit. You know, we all do. Exactly. Yeah, man. Uh, I wanted to move on to my last question for you. Yeah, yeah. And it's um, it's the question that, I don't know, this has to be like the fourth consecutive podcast where I'm doing this. 
Um, but it's pretty it's thing, much, man. and I think I asked you, I think I actually asked you when you were on the podcast last time, if you could convey a message to the entire human race, assuming every human being could understand you, <laughs> uh, what would be your message for the human race today on January 29th, 3, 10 PM, 2021 California time. Shit. It's 3, 10 already. Um, <laughs> you're like, damn, it's 3, 10 <laughs> No, that's that's fine. That's fine. Though. I'm glad. I'm glad. I, I'm glad we uh, started earlier. Um. So my message to be to all humans, if they could understand me, is there is no replacing. There is no replacing one another. There is no replacement for human uh, interactions, and we are not obligated to always like one another we may not always be obligated to um enjoy or even condone what each other is doing but we should each be able to find a way of keeping this human project going of keeping human civilization human species uh going and on the other token of that we should or the other side of that we should be on the watch for those whom are seeking to throw a wrench in the works that, or are trying to consolidate the benefits of human labor and human activity for themselves or for a select group. Um, these things that we do and create should be either available to everyone or, or we're not, or you know, they should be available to everyone, you know, saying at all times. And anybody who is trying to come in and say that, no, that there should be exclusions about who is allowed access to resources or information or human decency and behavior and consideration, um, they are a problem and they are uh, antithetical to, to, to any type of optimistic or positive uh, result of, human, of, hum, of the human project. All right, man. Thank yeah. you so much, Sam Boy, for, having, for coming on the podcast for the second time. I've really appreciated this conversation like the last one. And I look forward to continuing to cultivate this this friendship and like we talked about at the very start of the podcast, just building this camaraderie and having these discussions which which I know is 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 basically encompassing everything we're talking about, you know? Yeah. So no, everything I, I, you just said, like this is what we're doing. We're living it right now. So I'm really I'm really glad and you know, there's gonna be people who tune into the podcast and who are gonna listen on. So yeah, man. Yeah, man, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'm definitely going to have to have you uh, come on my podcast as well <laughs> and reciprocate. And, you know, yeah, I look forward to continuing this and keeping, you know, I'm saying this this portion of, of the human project, this little this little slice of the pie that we have to work with. I'm looking forward to seeing how it further develops. Sounds good, man. I'm going to stop the recording and then we'll officially say bye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>